It's been two years since the destruction of the Institute. The sole survivor interacted with all the major players in the struggle for the Commonwealth, but ultimately sided with the Minutemen and led the attack against the Institute. This left many in the Brotherhood and Railroad unhappy and resentful, but in the end all were glad the Institute was gone. With the Institute gone, the Commonwealth could now focus on rebuilding. At the head of the reconstruction effort was the sole survivor. He held a conference to discuss the formation of a united Commonwealth. All major settlements, such as Diamond City, Good Neighbor, Bunker Hill, Vault 81, and so on had sent a representative. The conference would also contain observers from the Brotherhood of Steel and several smaller settlements who were still on the fence about joining a greater Commonwealth. The railroad was also invited but refused to attend due to the presence of the Brotherhood. After days of discussion, an agreement was reached to form the United Commonwealth Territories, or the UCT for short. This government was, naturally, greatly influenced by the sole survivor, and thus greatly resembled that of the pre-war United States. The government would consist of three major branches, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial. At the head of the executive branch was the president, not long after the official formation of the UCT and the signing of the Constitution, elections were held to elect the first president of the new UCT government. The sole survivor would reluctantly agree to run due to popular demand. He was considered a legend in the Commonwealth, and both the citizenry and politicians alike wanted him to be at the helm of this new Commonwealth government. He would win 100% of the vote as no one bothered to even contest him in the election. With that, the Commonwealth had its first ever president. The president, however, could not handle all duties of the executive branch on his own. For this reason, the cabinet was established. The presidential cabinet consisted of the heads of all the different departments of the government along with the president, his vice president, and often other high-ranking officials who were close to the president. In the early days of the UCT, there were only a few departments that had been created. These departments consisted of the Department of Reconstruction and Development, the Department of the Treasury, the Department of Foreign Affairs, and the Department of Agriculture. The Department of Reconstruction and Development would oversee just that, the reconstruction and development of the Commonwealth. Their tasks included things such as building homes, repairing roads, maintaining energy and water, and much more. They were by far the largest department of them all. They consisted almost entirely of part-time volunteers from all over the Commonwealth with the exception of some full government officials and the occasional paid laborers. The Department of the Treasury was in charge of overseeing the economic affairs of the government. They managed the budget, collected taxes, and worked out the logistics of trade caravans. They were a rather unpopular agency, and at times required the use of military force to get their job done. They might have been seen as tyrannical by some, but it is undeniable that they were important in keeping the government from going bankrupt. The Department of Foreign Affairs was in charge of maintaining and improving foreign relations. They worked to negotiate treaties, trade deals, and much more. Since the early Commonwealth was limited to its immediate surroundings, there wasn't much need for the department's services. Thus, it received poor funding and was the smallest of the four departments. While the Commonwealth was now much more at peace without the Institute to terrorize it, it was still far from a safe place. Raiders, Gauls, super mutants, and much more still plagued the Commonwealth with raiders proving to be especially troublesome. The first to combat these threats were the Minutemen, with mixed results. However, there was now going to be a more united and coordinated effort to rid the Commonwealth of these threats. The UCT would work to mobilize the Commonwealth militias. It ordered all settlements to raise their militias and have them on standby for the following campaign. The first phase of this new campaign was going to begin in downtown Boston. The militias of Diamond City Good Neighbor and Bunker Hill were the first to be mobilized. They were to support the Minutemen in clearing downtown Boston of the largest raider gang yet, Bosco's gang. Forces began to build up on the border of the UCT. Some forces found themselves under attack by small bands of raiders, and with that the raider skirmishes had begun. The assault began with forces attacking from Bunker Hill and Diamond City. The initial stages aimed at securing the northern bridges to ensure raiders couldn't flee north towards Cambridge. The forces in the southeast would push the raiders north in hopes of forcing them into Boston Common where they would be able to easily pick them off. The Diamond City and Bunker Hill groups worked to accomplish something similar, pushing the raiders east and south. While all this was taking place, both sides found themselves having to endure 
the attacks from super mutants who thought of it all as a big game in which they would come on top. This hindered the campaign as you see T forces often suffered heavy casualties when fighting the mutants and it forced them to leave men behind to guard the rear. Once the raiders had been forced into Boston Common, the forces that had been guarding Good Neighbor were able to join the fight. Good Neighbor had been under siege by raiders from the beginning of the fighting. This was expected so the UCT ensured that the settlement was well fortified beforehand. The Good Neighbor forces split into two with one force aiding the forces at Boston Common and another heading east to clear the harbor. What would follow was weeks of bloody fighting that would only come to an end after Bosco's death. Bosco was killed in an ambush, where Minutemen caught a group of raiders heading east. Amongst these raiders was Bosco, who was heavily guarded. The group was small, and it seemed that they planned on taking a small raft to reach the other side, where presumably they would be received by men of Zeller's army. It's believed that Bosco was intending on meeting with Zeller to form an alliance to counter the growing threat posed by the UCT. However, this meeting would never come to be, as Bosco would be killed in the ambush. Minutemen forces had spotted the group the day prior and prepared for an ambush farther ahead. When the group came close enough, the Minutemen opened fire. The raiders were caught completely off guard and were quickly eliminated. Bosco was reported to have taken multiple bullet wounds before going down, but in the end he would fall. News quickly reached the rest of Bosco's gang, and most surrendered soon after. While gunners, ghouls, and mutants still remained in downtown Boston, with the raiders gone, the area was safer than ever before, and the Minutemen could now establish regular patrols. In the end, the campaign lasted about two months and saw the death of about 150 people. It was considered a success. However, there were more battles to come. What would follow was campaigns held against the Cambridge and Lexington gangs who would also soon fall. Taking advantage of this winning spree, the UCT wanted to also go after the gangs that hid in the countryside of the Commonwealth, who often raided farms and traders coming from outside regions. However, the UCT would run into problems in doing so. Larger settlements such as Diamond City Good Neighbor and Bunker Hill were all for helping clear their surrounding areas. However, they were much less keen on aiding the countryside settlements. Raising and maintaining a militia was a costly effort and it was a cost that was mostly covered by the settlements themselves. It often required conscription as well, making it even more unpopular amongst the residents of these settlements. Thus, these larger settlements outright refused to send any manpower to aid in the countryside campaigns. To make matters worse, a defensive pact had formed between all the remaining raider gangs to combat the ever-increasing threat posed by the UCT. If that wasn't bad enough, morale began to drop amongst the Minutemen. Colonels began to argue more often with each other, and certain Minutemen groups outright refused to work with each other. It was clear that something needed to change. The sole survivor, like before, would be at the forefront of this upcoming change. The sole survivor's time leading the fight against the raider gangs made him realize that a united commonwealth needed a proper military to defend it. Up until that point, defense was left up to the local settlement militias and Minutemen volunteers. This decentralized structure led to many internal conflicts. The militias were usually poorly trained and equipped. Men from different militias would often fight each other, and at times settlements outright refused to send any manpower to aid in anything other than local campaigns. The Minutemen, while more well-disciplined and trained, still suffered from many of the same problems. They had a mostly decentralized command structure, poor equipment, and lacked the manpower to combat all the threats of the Commonwealth on their own. There needed to be a professional force that answered directly to the government as opposed to part-time militias that would only ever be loyal to their own settlement. Thus, the sole survivor would draft a proposal to Congress that would form an official military force for the UCT. This proposal would lead to some fierce debate between the progressives and the conservatives. Progressives believe that a more centralized government is needed to effectively rebuild the Commonwealth. The conservatives, on the other hand, believe that the government should be more decentralized and that the power and decision-making should primarily be left up to the individual individual settlements. Conservatives were mostly made up of those from major settlements like Diamond City and Good Neighbor who were already relatively well off on their own. Smaller settlements gravitated more towards the progressives as they required more aid and protections from the government in order to prosper and maintain order. After some fierce debate, the progressives would win by a landslide and the UCT military would be formed. The military would consist of two major branches, the Commonwealth Defense Force and the Commonwealth Maritime Security Force. The Commonwealth Defense Force, or CDF for short, would be in charge of all land operations. It would mostly consist of basic infantrymen and some artillery. 
but with time it would expand its role and arsenal. The Commonwealth Maritime Security Forces, or CMSF for short, would be tasked with the defense of the Commonwealth's shores. In reality, their role was more of a support one. They would be in charge of the transportation of troops and supplies from one side of the coast to the other and with time this would also include Far Harbor. Its ranks would consist of some small pre-war fishing boats, sailors to man said boats, and marines to defend them. The marines would act as their own branch, but would still be under the CMSF's command. Their specialty would be the defense of CMSF boats and combat in more wetland-like environments. Due to their history, they would hold a reputation of skilled and fierce fighters. We'll touch more on that in the future. The last part of the military would be the Minutemen. The sole survivor wished for the Minutemen to integrate into the military and make up a majority of the new UCT military. However, many Minutemen were reluctant to join a proper military, and this caused a split within the Minutemen. Some went on to join the military while others opted not to. An arrangement was eventually agreed upon to have the Minutemen be its own separate entity completely independent of the military, but still be loyal to the UCT government. They would also receive federal funding but would be given more autonomy than the military. This special treatment led to much resentment in the ranks of the UCT military towards the Minutemen. It led to a rivalry between the Minutemen and military who would always compete for being the better force. However, the early UCT military had greater issues to address. In order to increase recruitment, the UCT government would undergo a long propaganda campaign. This campaign would focus on creating a stronger national identity and giving the newly formed UCT military a good look. While there were a significant number of recruits joining both branches of the military, it was just not enough to protect the entirety of the UCT. However, not all was bad as the new force did prove to be a significant improvement over their previous system. While only slightly larger than the combined Minutemen and militia forces, this new military responded directly to the government and thus was easier to control. It was also easier to fund and maintain, instead of having to arm multiple smaller groups that were not loyal to the federal government. The government now only funded one group who responded directly to it. This new military would be assigned to work immediately. Patrols were established all throughout the UCT's controlled territory. Along with this they would help in clearing out downtown Boston of super mutants and feral goals. This, however, would be easier said than done. The ferals were all over the area. The troops would need to cover every inch of downtown Boston to fully clear it. Meanwhile, they would also have to deal with the super mutants. The super mutants proved to be especially troublesome as they managed to keep the combined Minutemen and UCT forces stalled for months. However, in the end, the UCT and Minutemen would come out on top. The UCT was beginning to feel more confident in bringing the fight to the Raiders, but first there was an ever-increasing problem that could no longer go unaddressed. While the UCT focused on rebuilding, and organizing, a war raged on in the Commonwealth. The railroad continued their efforts to save cents, but now it wasn't from their institute slavers, but rather from the Brotherhood's witch hunts. The railroad had become emboldened after the institute's destruction and now operated more in the open. They increased recruitment efforts and began to openly engage the Brotherhood. Firefights became the norm, leaving many dead and the Commonwealth population in fear of being caught in the crossfire. This prompted an intervention by the UCT. They helped negotiate a ceasefire. The railroad agreed knowing that they could not continue to take heavy losses and would need time to reorganize. The Brotherhood, however, would require more convincing. The UCT opted for a strategy of appeasement, as they knew a war with the Brotherhood would destroy everything they had worked so hard to build and could likely mean the end of the Union itself. The UCT would promise to drop any claims they had to the lands within the Commonwealth that were currently controlled by the Brotherhood. They were also forced to agree to turn in any former institute scientist, synths, and weapons considered to be too dangerous for the common man by the Brotherhood. Along with this, the UCT was to allow the Brotherhood to carry out its mission in UCT-controlled territory without any interference. The arrangement had left many within the UCT unhappy, but ultimately it helped prevent conflict, for now.